In the happy interval that ensued, my father apologized to my mother, who in turn confessed about the country club, for which my father had no choice but to forgive her. Then he turned his attention back to his boys. My mother didn't see that there was anything to do. I like to talking to the judge, said my father. This is not Shauna, said my mother. I'm only talking to him. I'm not give him money unless he wants it. So you're going to land up in jail. So what else I should do? My father threw up his hands. Those are my boys. Your boys, exploded my mother. What about your family? What about your wife? My father took a long sip of tea. You know, he said finally, in the war, my father sent our cook to the soldiers to use. He always said it. The province comes before the town. The town comes before the family. A restaurant is not a town, said my mother. My father sipped at his tea again. You know, when I first came to the United States, I also had to hide and seek with those deportation guys. If people did not help in me, I'm not here today. My mom scrutinized her hem. After a minute, I volunteered that before seeing a judge, he might try a lawyer. He turned. Since when did you become so afraid like your mother? I started to say that it wasn't a matter of fear, but he cut me off. What I need today, he said, is a son. My father and I spent the better part of the next day standing in lines at the immigration office. He did not get to speak to a judge, but with much persistence, he managed to speak to a judge's clerk who tried to persuade him that it was not her place to extend him advice. My father, though, shamelessly plied her with compliments and offers of free pancakes until she finally conceded that she personally doubted anything would happen to either Cedric or Booker. Especially if they're needed workers, she said, rubbing at the red marks her glasses left on her nose. She yawned. Have you thought about sponsoring them to become permanent residents? Could he do that? My father was overjoyed. And what if he sought to it right away? Would she perhaps put in a good word with the judge? She yawned again, her nostrils flaring. Don't worry, she said. They'll get a fair hearing. My father returned jubilant. Booker and Cedric hailed him as their savior, their Buddha incarnate. He was like a father to them, they said. And laughing and clapping, they made him tell the story over and over, sorting over the details like jewels. And how old was the assistant judge? And what did she say? That evening, my father tipped the paper boy a dollar and brought bought a pot of mums for my mother, who suffered them to be placed on the dining room table. The next night, he took us all to, out to dinner. Then on Saturday, Mona found a letter on my father's chair at the restaurant. Dear Mr. Chang, you are the great boss, but we do not like to trial, so we're running away now. Please to excuse us. People saying the law in America is fears like dragon. Here is only $140. We hope someday we can pay back the rest bail. You will get an interest as you deserving so great a boss you are thank you for everything and next life will be born in rich family with no more pancakes yours truly booker and cedric and the weeks that followed my father went to the pancake house for crises but otherwise hung around our house fiddling idly with the sump pump and boiler in an effort he said to get ready for winter it was as though he had gone into retirement except that instead of moving south he had moved to the basement he even took to showering my mother with little attentions into calling her old girl, and when we finally heard the club had entertained all the applications it could for the year, he was so sympathetic that he seemed more disappointed than my mother. Mrs. Lardner tempered the bad news with an invitation to a bon voyage bash she was throwing for a friend of hers who was going to Greece for six months. Do come, she urged. You'll meet everyone, and then you know if things open up in the spring, she waved her hands. My mother wondered if it would be appropriate to show up at a party for someone they didn't know. But the honest truth was that this was an annual affair. If it's not Greece, it's the Antibes, sighed Mrs. Lardner. We really just do it because his wife left him and his daughter doesn't speak to him and poor Jeremy just feels so unloved. She also invited Mona and me to the goings-on as demi-guests to keep Annie out of the champagne. I wasn't too keen on the idea, but before I could say anything, she had already thanked us for so generously agreeing to honor her with our presence. A pair of little princesses you are, she told us, a pair of princesses. The party was that Sunday. On Saturday, my mother took my father out shopping for a suit. As it was the end of September, she insisted that he buy a worsted rather than a seersucker, even though it was only 10 rather than 50% off. My father protested that it was as hot out as ever, which was true, a thick Indian summer had cozied murderously up to us, but to no avail. Summer clothes, said my mother, was not properly worn after Labor Day. The suit was unfortunately as extravagant in length as it was in price, which posed an additional quandary, since the tailor wouldn't be until Monday. 
The sales girl, though, found a way of tacking it up temporarily. Maybe this suit not fit me, fretted my father. Just don't take your jacket off, said the sales girl. He gave her a tip before they left, but when he got home, refused to remove the price tag. I like to ask the tailor about the size, he insisted. You mean you're going to wear it and then return it? Mona rolled her eyes. I didn't say I'm return it, said my father stiffly. I liked asking the tailor, that's all. The party started off swimmingly, except that most people were wearing Bermudas or wrapped skirts. Still, my parents carried on, sharing with great feeling the complaints about the heat. Of course, my father tried to eat a cracker full of shallots and burnt himself in an attempt to help Mr. Lardner turn the coals of the barbecue, but on the whole, he seemed to be doing all right. Not nearly so well as my mother, though, who had accepted an entire cupful of Mrs. Lardner's magic punch and seemed indeed to be under some spell. As Mona and Annie skirmished over whether some boy in their class inhaled when he smoked, I watched my parent mother take off her shoes, laughing and laughing, as a man with a beard regaled her with navy stories by the pool. Apparently, he had been stationed in the Orient and remembered a few words of Chinese, which made my mother laugh still more. My father excused himself to go to the men's room and then drifted back and weighed anchor at the hors d'oeuvres table while my mother sailed on to a group of women who tinkled at length over the clarity of her complexion. I dug out a book I had bought, brought. Just when I'd cracked the spine, though, Mrs. Lardner came by to bewail her shortage of servers. Her caterers were criminals. I agreed, and the next thing I knew, I was handing out bits of marine life, making the rounds as amicably as I, amicably as I could. Here you go, Dad, I said when I got to the hors d'oeuvres table. Everything's fine, he said. I hesitated to leave him alone, but then the man with the beard zeroed in on him, and though he talked of nothing but my mother, I thought it would be okay to get back to work. Just that moment, though, Jeremy Brothers lurched our way, an empty, albeit corked wine bottle in hand. He was a slim, well-proportioned man with a Roman nose and small eyes and a nice manly jaw that he allowed to hang agape. Hello, he said drunkenly. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meeting you, said my father. Right, said Jeremy. Right. Listen, I have this bottle here, this most recalcitrant bottle. You see that it refuses to do my bidding. I bid it open sesame, please, and it does nothing. He pulled the cork out with his teeth, then turned the bottle upside down. My father nodded. Would you have a word with it, please, said Jeremy. The man with the beard excused himself. Would you please have a damned word with it? My father laughed uncomfortably. Ah, Jeremy bowed a little. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. You are not my man, not my man at all. He bowed again and started to leave, but then circled back. Viticulture is not your forte. Yes, I can see that. See that plainly. But may I trouble you on another matter? Forget the damn bottle. He threw it into the pool. He winked at the people who splashed. I have another matter. Do you speak Chinese? My father said he did not, but Jeremy pulled out a handkerchief with some characters on it anyway, saying that his daughter had sent it from Hong Kong and that he thought the characters might be some secret message. Long life, said my father. You have, you haven't even looked at it yet. I know what it says without looking, my father winked at me. You do? Yes, I do. You're making fun to me, aren't you? No, 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 said my father, winking again. Who are you anyway, said Jeremy. His smile fading, my father shrugged. Who are you? My father shrugged again. Jeremy began to roar. This is my party, my party, and I've never seen you before in my life. My father backed up as Jeremy came toward him. Who are you? Who are you? Just as my father was going to step back into the pool, Mrs. Lardner came running up. Jeremy informed her that there was a man crashing his party. Nonsense, said Mrs. Lardner. This is Ralph Chang, who I invited extra specially so he could meet you. She straightened the collar of Jeremy's peach-colored polo shirt for him. Yes, well, we've had a chance to chat, said Jeremy. She whispered in his ear. He mumbled something. He whispered something more. I do apologize, he said finally. My father didn't say anything. I do. Jeremy seemed genuinely contrite. Dad, you've seen drugs before, haven't you? You must have them in China. Okay, said my father. As Mrs. Lardner glided off, Jeremy clapped his hand over my father's shoulders. You know, I really am quite sorry, quite sorry. My father nodded. What can I do? How can I make it up to you? No, tell me, tell me, wheedled. Jeremy, take us to casino night. My father shook his head. You don't gamble. Dinner at Bartholomew's? My father shook his head again. You don't eat. Jeremy scratched his chin. You know, my wife was like you. Old Annabelle could never let me make things up. Never, 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 never. My father wriggled out from under his arm. How about sports clothes? You are rather overdressed, you know. Excuse me for saying so. But here, he took off his polo shirt and folded it up. You could have this with my most profound apologies. He ruffled his chest hairs with his free hand. No, thank you, said my father. 
No, take it, take it, accept my apologies. He thrust the shirt into my father's arms. I am so very sorry, so very sorry. Please, try it on. Helplessly holding the shirt, my father searched the crowd for my mother. Here, I'll help you off with your coat. My father froze. Jeremy reached over and took his jacket off. Milton's $125 reduced to $112.50, he read. What a bargain, what a bargain. Please get it back, pleaded my father, please. Now for your shirt, ordered Jeremy. Heads began to turn. Take off your shirt. I do not take orders like a servant, announced my father. Take off your shirt or I'm going to throw this jacket right into the pool, just right into this little pool here. Jeremy held it over the water. Go ahead. One hundred twelve fifty taunted Jeremy. One hundred twelve. My father flung the polo shirt into the water with such force that part of it bounced back into the air like a fluorescent fountain. Then it settled into a soft heap on top of the water. My mother hurried up. You're a sport, said Jeremy, suddenly breaking into a smile and slapping my father on the back. You're a sport. I like that. A man with spirit. That's what you are. A man with panache. Allow me to return to you your jacket. He handed it back to my father. Good value you got on that. Good value. My father hurled the coat into the pool, too. We're leaving, he said grimly. Leaving. Now, Ralphie, said Mrs. Lardner, bustling up. My father was already stomping off. Get your sister, he told me. To my mother, get your shoes. That was great, Dad, said Mona as he walked down to the car. You were stupendous. Way to show him, I said. What? said my father offhandedly. Although it was only just dusk. We were in a gulch, which made it hard to see anything except the gleam of his white shirt moving up the hill ahead of us. It was all my fault, began my mother. Forget it, said my father grandly. Then he said, the only trouble is I left those keys in my jacket pocket. Oh, no, said Mona. Oh, no, was right, said my mother. So we'll walk home, I said. But how are we going to get into the house, said Mona. The noise of the park churned through the silence. Someone has to, has to, be, has to going back, said my father. Let's go to the pancake house first, suggested my mother. We can wait there until the party is finished and then call Mrs. Lardner. Having all agreed that was a good plan, we started walking again. God, just think, said Mona. We're going to have to die for them. My father stopped a moment. We waited. You girls are good swimmers, he said finally. Not like me. Then his shirt started moving again, and we trooped up the hill after it into the dark.